Hi guys, this is Steve Moss, pastor at Boulevard Christian Church. God's mission for us here at Boulevard is really simple. We help people find Jesus and we help people follow Jesus. And our teaching team hopes that this message that you're about to listen to will help you learn to grow and trust Him more than before. If it does, would you consider giving a gift to Boulevard to help us carry out the mission that God has given us? Thanks. We hope your heart is fully open to what God has for you in this message today. Good morning, church. Glad you guys are here this morning, man. My name is Jim Landis. I'm one of the pastors here at the church and super glad to be here, uh, especially starting our new series. It's called Pathways. And as you can tell, there's all types of people up there because Pathways for Community is for all people. So I grew up with two brothers. I have a brother that's a year older than me, and I have a brother that's three years younger than me. I know. Hard to believe I'm a middle child. It's hard, it's hard to tell I'm the black sheep of the family, but it is true. And growing up um, with, th- with three teenage boys was difficult. <laughs> I'll tell that to my mama. It was difficult. and I thought this was completely normal, but I guess not. I didn't know that most moms don't go to the store every single day. Like, I thought that was just a normal part of growing up. But the reality is they just couldn't keep up with all the food we were eating, and they just had to put it down. I had to go to the store every single day. When I was a young man, elementary school, I actually went to a Kansas City Royals baseball game. We would go to Royals games often because the Royals were so bad at baseball. It cost $5, $5 to get into the game. Parking was like three times the cost of the ticket because the Royals were so bad. I remember going to games, and we would typically go on Firework Fridays, right? When you're a young kid, Firework Fridays is the best. So I went to one game, but this game sticks out to me. Because at this game, one of my brothers got lost. Now, I don't even know which brother it was, because I don't care, because in that moment I was scared. I don't know the score of the game. I don't know who they were playing. All that I remember is my brother got lost. And, and seemingly if millions of people, right, at these baseball games, at least you think that when you're a child, and millions of people at this game, and the parents tell you the dreaded words, sit right here, I'll be right back. Nope, you're not going anywhere. You better not, like kind of a thing. And so it sat there with my other brother, and we just sat there and waited. We waited for five hours. I bet it was five minutes, but it felt like five hours. And so you're sitting here, you're panicking, because I knew that I was now lost. And I was like, I'm just lost. I'm going to be alone forever. I, I guess my little brother or older brother, whoever was with me, we're going to have to set up shop over here. We're going to live over here now, and maybe we'll find new parents. We just thought that we were always going to be alone. And maybe you feel like that right now. You're an adult, though. You're not at a Royals baseball game, and you might not be lost, but you feel very, very alone. No matter what you're going through or what's going on in your life, here's what I want to tell you. Whatever, whatever reason you're here, you find yourself at church this morning, I want you to know you don't have to do it alone. And one of the things I love about Boulevard, of the many things, man, we are a multi-generational church. And what I see just in this auditorium is a lot of young people and old people and everyone in between. And while ministry may look different with a 70-year-old than it does a 50-year-old, than it does a 30-year-old, than it does a 3-year-old, the reality is we are all We are all here because of one man named Jesus. Now, again, it looks a lot different, different people, right? Just this past week, we got done with VBS, Vacation Bible School for our elementary age kids, and I got the honor of doing recreation time. Now, as I'm planning recreation time for first, second, third, fourth, and fifth graders, I do not have you in mind because I don't think the games that I played with the first graders you would enjoy very much. And my high schoolers are, are not mine anymore. Ethan's high schoolers just got back from CIY Move, and I got to hear all about the trip. Now, they did some crazy chaotic things. You guys saw some of those videos. Of they, does that look fun to you? Yeah. Maybe for Alan. Okay, Alan thinks it looks fun. All right. But the normal people are like, hey, I'll watch you have fun, and that looks great for you, but you don't want anything to do with that. I mean, the reality is we got a bunch of different people at this church in a lot of different programs right now. But do you know it's the same God that works in all of us? And maybe you're kind of new to this Christian thing or you're new to Boulevard and you started coming this summer and you're trying to figure out what is this about? What is Boulevard, what is Boulevard all about? 
And what I want to tell you at the beginning of this series, it'll be a three-week series, but at the beginning of this series, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, I pray and I challenge you to take Christian community seriously. And you'll be able to do that here in a few short weeks as we get ready to launch city groups. Now, groups have been important my entire life whenever I was on my personal journey and my spiritual journey. When I was in fourth grade is when my family started attending church. And so we found the church closest to our house, a little neighborhood church. And as we went to that church, that's where I met John Heffron and Gary Simjanel. Those, mean, those names mean nothing to you, but everything to me. Because those were just two dads. Those were just two dads that did the fourth and fifth grade in which they actually introduced me to God. They made God interesting. They made God kind of fun. It wasn't this boring book I always thought it to be. But that was in a small group known as a Sunday school class. Then when I got a little bit older, I got involved in the student ministry. And the very first time I got called out for my sin was done by my youth minister during a small group time with a bunch of other junior high boys. Now, it didn't feel very good. In fact, I'm pretty sure I got really upset. But you know what I needed in that moment was a group of guys that followed Jesus, that loved Jesus, and wanted to challenge me, even as an adult. Can I tell you that some of my family's most impactful and meaningful times in our spiritual lives, a lot of them happen in this room as we're worshiping with our body of Christ, but oftentimes it happens on Tuesday nights in my living room. And some of the more impactful moments aren't just my city group times that meet, but actually it's after my city group leaves. And then my kids go to bed, and I'm sitting there having a conversation with Jackie. And we talk about what somebody had said, and we kind of say, what, is that, what does that look like for us? And we wrestle, and something that got introduced. I'm telling you this powerful moment in my life, and not just my life, but the life of my children. You know, I got two kids that are back in BC Kids right now. And if they were the only two that showed up, I don't think they would like it very much. But your kids are back there as well. And they're worshiping and they're in small groups and they're doing crafts. Like, what a powerful expression of the church. There's just something special about sitting down, being intentional with each other and our relationships. We study God's word and then we find ourselves in here worshiping with our entire congregation. Man, that is special. So here's what I'm hoping. This Pathways series that you would take me up on this challenge, that you would not no longer use the excuse, maybe next year when things kind of calm down, but this year you decide and you determine, I'm going to be involved in community, and this year I'm going to join a group. Here's a question I want you to answer inside your own head, and it's rhetorical, which means you answer it yourself, but how would you describe the church? In your own words, in your own head, how would you describe the church? When I say the church, are you thinking of how you would describe it? What would you say? Would, would you describe this building? Would you describe this room? Would it be that's that one church that has the fountains? That's that one church that's by Chick-fil-A? That's how I often describe what, what, what church I go to, the one by Chick-fil-A. Or would you describe the people? And if I gave you truth serum... And you had to be honest about the people, not this Christian acceptable serum, but truth serum. How would you describe us, the church? See, Jesus says things like this. If you are tired and worn out, come to me. He says things like if if you are weary and you need rest, my burden is light. When Jesus talks about the church, he says things like, man, the gates of hell will not overcome it. But herein lies the problem. If we're using that way to describe the church, that's not what I typically hear others when they're describing outside of the church. You hear more words like judgmental, bigoted, hypocritical. And dare I even say, some people believe now irrelevant. That maybe this book and maybe this concept is kind of outdated And maybe it worked like thousands of years ago in the right culture, but we're kind of advanced. And we all know people that have had bad experiences with the church. I'm sure you have bad experiences with the church. I know you know people that have been hurt by Christians, and maybe you find yourself there as well. So what should our, then, what should our expectation of the church be? What does Jesus say the church should be? Simply put, here's why Boulevard exists. Our mission 
The whole reason, the whole kit and caboodle, we exist to help people find and follow Jesus. That's what we do. And so if I were to take a quick poll, I want your participation. Please participate. But please, there's no bad answers. I just want your real answers. How did you come to Boulevard Christian Church? If you were to say the reason why you came, how many of you came to this church? Because you saw one of our posts online? Or you saw something on Facebook? Or you saw a video of a good-looking bald man on stage and you thought, I have to be there? How many of you guys thought that's why you entered our building for the very first time? Anybody? Based online? Okay, how about this? How many of you guys saw when you drove past this big church with fountains and has a big old sign outside? And maybe you saw something on the sign. It, it, it got your interest and you saw a series or you saw a program and you thought, hey, I've never been there. I want to check it out. Did anybody come to Boulevard because of the sign? A couple people? Sweet. How many of you guys then started coming to church because you knew somebody who worshiped here or you knew somebody that attended here and you thought, I want to give that a shot. Or maybe you got invited to a program. You got invited to a VBS. You got invited to a whatever it may have been. But you knew somebody at Boulevard. And so you thought, a relationship will maybe get me to Boulevard. How many of you guys came to Boulevard for the first time because of relationship? I think that's pretty effective. I think that's the way we should go. I don't think our Facebook is going to bring people in. I think it's you. And I think your relationships and your community are what make this place special. Here's my experience. Talked about it a little bit, but I started going to church in the fourth grade. And the reason, I called my dad and asked, why did we start going to church? Like, what got you to get us to go into church? And he said this. Again, three brothers. I was in fourth grade. He said, my grandpa came up to me and said, you need to get those boys in church because you got three little hell raisers on your hands and you got to change them right now. No lie. I stand here, a pastor, and the reason why my family got involved in church is because my dad was afraid I was going to get arrested, right? And so here we are, and it's just amazing to see what God has done, but that's my experience at the church. And here's what my brothers did. We were new to church, and so we thought we had to do what Christians do. And so we, we believed this is what we had to do. We had to get nice clothes. We didn't have any nice clothes. And so what we got is we all got long sleeve button-up blue shirts, and we wore them. And we got khaki pants, and we got the cheapest dress shoes we could find, and we wore the same outfit every Sunday for an entire year. Not because that was the church's dress code, but we believed this is what God wants us to do. Like, God wants us to not get arrested, wear nice clothes, and don't talk too much during church. And so we kept coming back to the church, but we didn't come because the building was awesome. In fact, I bet my calculations, my church uh, might be about one-tenth the size of this church, right? It wasn't the building that brought it in. And I love my home church, Town and Country Christian Church in Topeka, Kansas. But it wasn't the worship team. The worship team wasn't that great. And, you know, I really liked our pastor. His name was Rick at the time, and I really loved Rick. And Rick was good, but it wasn't like it knocked my socks off. Do you know what kept us coming back to the church? It wasn't a program, it wasn't the lights, it wasn't the stage, it was the people. It was Gary Simjian now. It was David Heffron that made church relevant and made an impact for me. And church, here's what we're going to do. The next three weeks, we're going to talk about pathways to community. But not just so you can just think about community, because we are going somewhere. And where we are going is into our fall signups and for you to join Christian community, maybe for the first time. Truth is, it's not just me that wants you in community, but God wants you in community. And I believe that your soul, believe it or not, is desperate for Christian community. But the first thing we can do, the very first thing we can do before we talk about this community is we need to address a barrier. And this is a barrier. This is a barrier, right? I I have an exercise that I think will help us out with this. But it only works if you take it seriously, all right, this will only work if you take it seriously. So here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. When you came in, you should have received a small piece of paper. And that small piece of paper has several questions on there. And here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Just hold on to it for a second. There should be some pens. If you did not grab a piece of paper, can you raise your hand up high? We wanna get you one. I got some peeps. If you do not have a piece of paper, raise your hand up real high. We got some peeps dishing out paper for you. Keep them up until you get one. How many of you guys need a pen? 
You can share a pen. All right, cool. Please take this seriously. Here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. When you get some time, I want you to read through those questions one at a time, and please do it honestly. Please do it anonymously. This is not getting back to you, I promise. Do not, do not write your name on the top. <laughs> all right, do not write your name on the top. That'll break the whole exercise, all right? Do not write your name on top, but I want you to go through. I know you probably came to church with your special somebody. This is not between you and the special somebody, all right? This is between you and the Lord. So please, even if you gotta give them a shoulder, be like, mind your own business, right? Do what you gotta do. Please fill out those questions. This only works, this only works if you apply. Here's what I would ask too. If you're a child, um, I'm okay with students participating in this, but if you're a child, uh, say like 10 years old and under, please do not participate. Um, we just don't want this to backfire on us. So go ahead, if you are 10 years or younger, go ahead and hold on to it. Now, what I want you to do is to fill that stuff out. Not the person next to you, and then once you're done filling it out, I want you to fold it one time in half. I want you to fold it one time in half. And what we have is we have some people that have some bags, um, some bags, so if you're one of my ushers with bags, could you go and start picking those up for me? Would really appreciate it. We've got some ushers with bags. We're gonna pick those up. Promise it will not get back to you. We don't have cameras hidden on you so we can tell who did what. It will be a great exercise in which we can talk about barriers. Here it is. As we're collecting these, please fill them out. Everyone fill one out, fill one out. It'll be worth it, I promise you. As we're filling that out, let's get to our scripture for the day. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 13. It'll be on the screen if you would like. But just in case, we got it on the board as well. I want to read to you a common story. It starts off this way. Once again, Jesus went beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. So here, let's pause for a second on this story because here's what you need to know. You see the name Levi. Levi is his Hebrew name, but his Greek name is Matthew. And what you may be more familiar with is his Greek name, Matthew. When you look at the New Testament books, Matthew, that's the guy. And so here is how Matthew came to be a disciple of Jesus. And you see here's Levi, you see Levi slash Matthew, and it gives you this detail that he's a tax collector. If you've been involved in church for very long, you probably know that tax collectors are seen very negatively, like crazy negatively. Um, quick notes version of it is basically this. If somebody were to come in and this is our country and occupy us, they would then take the highest bid. Who wants to be the collector of money for us? And you guys would volunteer. And if somebody would volunteer to be the trader and to collect our money, the government would actually, you can actually take a little bit more off the top if you want to, because they'll never know. And so one of us in here is going to get rich while the rest of us get more and more poor. This was Matthew. This was Levi. So this is the man that Jesus comes onto the scene. Why would he ever want a tax collector to be part of his ranks? And here's where we find Matthew. It says this, verse 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and the disciples. And there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, that's another word maybe we're not too familiar with in a second, they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, and here's what they asked his disciples. Pharisees asked Jesus' disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners. You see this word Pharisee, and Pharisee is just a religious leader, a religious elite, but the word Pharisee actually means separate. And so here we are, the Pharisees are asking the disciples, hey, if Jesus is who he says he is, why in the world would he not separate himself from these kinds of people? The last person you want to be associated with is these kinds of people. But here's how Jesus responds. On hearing this, here's what Jesus said. It is not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. He said, I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call sinners. And that seems obvious. And you're like, dude, why did I get up this morning to say, hey, Jesus is in for sinners. I already knew that. Right? I'm not checking into the ER because my day has been going great. Right? Sick people, hurt people, broken people. They're the ones that need a doctor, not the healthy. 
My son Isaac is six years old going into the first grade and this is a couple years ago, but he had bad ear infections. And so we take him to the doctor, we get him the, air, the, the little air, uh, ear drops and we take care of all that stuff. So we give him the ear drops, we give him medicine, but it just wasn't working quickly enough for Mr. Ike. And so here's what he asks us. Will you put a Band-Aid on my ear? How do I, how do I explain to him? All right, Band-Aid could help, but it's not gonna help your ear. But he's, nope, put the Band-Aid on my ear. I need help, I need help. And I'm like, the Band-Aid won't do it. Put the Band-Aid on my ear. So you know what we did? We put the Band-Aid on his ear, absolutely. We put the Band-Aid on his ear, and it all felt better in that moment. But I don't think, I don't think it really helped him. I don't think it really helped him. Here's the thing about broken people. Right? Here's the thing about broken people. And this is a little illustration. The way we typically see is here's a person. Very good artist, by the way, so you're welcome. All right, and here's another person. And what ends up happening with broken people, with sinful people, when things happen, if you've ever had a relationship longer than five minutes, you've discovered this, people are messy. People are difficult. And what ends up happening is we put a little barrier around them. And see, us humans, we're pretty dang good. We're pretty good about uh, separating ourselves. We're pretty good at making sure that we are separating and comparing one another. But this is what happens. This is what happens when you find out Jesus, though, came for the broken person. See, we tend to separate ourselves from broken people. But what I see in the Bible, what I see in Scripture, is that God doesn't separate himself from sinful people. No, he actually goes to the broken people. We kind of have this, maybe this idea backwards that we are the Jesus people in here, the Christians that are up early on a Sunday morning. But when I look at the Bible, and Jesus says that he didn't come for those that think they're righteous, but instead he came for the sinful people. There's this article that I heard referenced, and, and it was called The Atrocious Math of the Gospel. And the, the author goes through and uses different examples of Jesus' life, and he compares it to math. And if you were to do this math, it just doesn't really add up very well. He goes through and tells stories, you know, like, God, God's like a shepherd, and if he has 100 sheep, and 99 of them are good and healthy and all taken care of, but one had run off, you know what God does is he leaves the 99 to go after the one. Now, if you were to look at that, you're like, hey, bad business decision, you got 99 good ones, you got one bad one. Forget about the one bad. Focus on the 99 good. God's not very good at math. There's a story of this sinful woman, this very sinful woman. It says that she has this expensive perfume. And I don't mean expensive like it cost you a paycheck or a month's wages. The Bible says this perfume was so expensive, it cost a year's worth of wages. And what does she do with the perfume? She just wetted his feet, and she poured perfume and dried it with her hair. And anybody, anybody could see that a year's worth of wages for a little perfume on feet. Bad math. That's terrible math. But what does God call it? He calls it good. See, there's this parable that Jesus says. He says the kingdom of God is kind of like a vineyard. And, and, and the owner of the vineyard, the owner of the business, at the very beginning, he needs a lot of workers. So he goes out early in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, and gets some workers. If you work for me, I will give you a full day's wages. And people sign up, they're ready to go. And the day keeps going, the day keeps going. It's midday, and he goes, hey, I need more laborers. So he goes back, and he hires more laborers, and the same thing at the end of the day. Third different time, he goes at the end of the day, the day's almost over, I need more laborers, who's down to work for me? And at the end of the story, the people that came last, they're the ones first to get paid, and they see that they get paid an entire day's worth of wages. And so the people in the back are like, holy smokes. They got a whole day's worth? They didn't work for very much. How much am I going to get? And then you see the story, and they get the same amount. That's bad business. That just doesn't add up. But have you noticed that grace doesn't always add up? That grace doesn't always make sense? And the grace that I see in the Bible with broken people, here's what I see. That grace doesn't require you to clean yourself up and then come to Jesus. No, grace is knowing that God cannot love you more. He cannot love you less. And grace is knowing that no matter what the circle even looks like around that person, that God can break through whatever hold of sin that that has on us. Church, this is good news. This is what the gospel means. 
And honestly, we can get kind of excited about this. We can say, absolutely, Jesus came for the broken. But can I tell you something else? We are all broken. And the moment that you think that God comes for the broken, one thing you need to know is that you also are broken. And in verse 17, again, verse 17, Jesus says, it's not the healthy who need the doctor, but it's the sick. He did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. What he's saying is, it's not about how righteous you can be. It's about recognizing what a sinner you are. See, Jesus' message, even to the Pharisees, even to the ones that love being separated, the ones that love being set apart, Jesus' message to them was not, you are not welcome. No, his message to them is, recognize who you are and come on in. Because anyone who comes to Jesus receives grace and everyone is welcome. So really, this isn't an accurate picture. The real picture is not, here's the messed up broken person and here's me. I'm also broken. I'm also broken. And we can all, we can all acknowledge this. We can all acknowledge this. The gospel, this good news, the reason why we talk about it so often in this room isn't because you are not familiar with it. It's not because this grace, we want to introduce you this topic of grace and you will love it. No, it's not even something that we just need to tell people out there. It's something that we desperately need in here, that we are all broken. And believe it or not, church, this is a very freeing place to be. Not because we get permission to sin all we want, but when you know that only God can do anything about my situation, then you actually have a plan moving forward. I think all of us as followers of Jesus, we have to recognize this. We have to recognize this. But I think it goes deeper than this. Because I I don't know any Christian adults that would say, I'm not sinful. And we all claim that we're sinful, and we kind of acknowledge that we're sinful, but what are you doing with that sin? Maybe there's a deeper lie that you are believing. And maybe here's the lie that you're believing. You know that you're broken, but you think you're the only one. And so what ends up happening is, here you have this person, you recognize you're broken. And when you believe this lie, when you believe this lie, church, here's what you do. You then take your circle, and you make it bigger and deeper and wider because you believe that you're the only person that struggles this way. You think you're the only person that, can, that has to hide this. And what ends up happening when you believe this lie, this is what you end up doing with your life, is you end up isolating, right? You start to think, I'm the only one that struggles this way. I'm the only one who's broken this way. I'm the only one that frequently messes up this way. I'm the only one that has these thoughts. I'm the only one that have done these things. And what ends up happening is that we believe we're the only one. Let me tell you what you probably won't do. You probably will not run to your community. Because outside of community, what this does is this makes you hide. This makes you pretend. This makes you forget. This makes you lie about who you really are. And then it makes you lie again to cover up your previous lie. You see, when you get deeper and deeper into your isolated sin, you get louder. You get angrier. And you start wondering why things aren't working out. And you know what I've noticed is that sometimes as Christians, when things get difficult, we run away. Instead of staying and fighting for what's right for the kingdom, we want to run away the second somebody calls us out on something. Here's what happens when you're not in community. Is you begin to see people as individuals just out there, bad, evil, or good. But then you begin to see it for yourself. And if you're honest about who yourself, you try to conceal, you try to, you try to hide. But here's what I want to tell you from stage. We all already know that you are broken. And you don't have to pretend anymore. You don't have to act like you have it all together, that you are broken. See, this was Jesus' message to the Pharisees. And I know we got a lot of religious people in here, and I need to speak to us religious people. You cannot separate yourselves He did not call those that are righteous, but he called those that aren't able to do it for themselves. Here's what I want you to know, man. You are not alone. And I know it feels this way. And you keep hearing about these pathways, and you keep hearing about this, but you're like, but I'm all by myself. And I know, Jim, that it's easy to sit up here and draw circles around a stick figure, but if you would know what I'm experiencing, maybe you would change your tune. 
if you were one of my ushers and, and you helped and you helped collect, here's what I would like for you to do. We went and mixed those up, but once you do, if, if you're an usher, go ahead and stand up. You start passing those out. What we are gonna do is we're gonna pass out those that you guys collected. No names are on there. They're all folded up. They went back there and mixed them all around. You will not be getting the same one that you filled out, but everyone needs one. So if you filled one out, please grab one. Please grab one as they come, as they come passing by. We're gonna have a little exercise to break down some barriers. So we are, everyone's gonna need a sheet. And just, and just again, just for clarity's sake, uh, the piece of paper that you got is not yours. The piece of paper that you got, you're representing somebody in this room. So again, if you filled one out, if you filled one out, please go ahead and grab one. Because what I'm gonna do, give you a moment here to receive it. And what's going to happen is I'm going to read each of these questions one at a time. What I want you to do is if the person that you're representing, if they have, if they've marked yes, if they marked off the box one at a time, when I tell you to stand, you're going to stand. We're going to go one at a time, so not yet. Not yet as we're still waiting. I wish I found more bags. Only found eight. So we got some, some time delay here. Everyone grabs one. And what, what we hope this does, what we hope this does is encourage you to know you are not alone. Some of the community aspects we have going to church, you hear a lot about city groups and we push city groups. But man, there are other abilities for you to be plugged into the body of Christ. Man, there are so many ministries for you to get involved in. You gotta ask. Man, there are so many adult Bible groups that meet at nine o'clock or 1030 in here. Ask a question, get involved. Um, Celebrate Recovery meets every Thursday for those with hurts, habits, and hangups. And I got, I got one of my best decisions in my life was to join Celebrate Recovery and to do a step study. And in these moments, what you'll notice is you'll get community with other people. You get community that's more powerful than what you could even imagine. Here's what we got. We're finishing passing some out here. Just grab one and pass it on down. Multiple times and opportunities for you to get involved and community. Who else needs one? Raise your hand if you still need one. Got some back there. If you guys got any extras, everyone needs one. Got two over there. Anyone got some extra papers? Make sure you guys are spreading them out so other people get them. So here we go. Here's what I would love. Here's what I would love. Anybody have any papers? Any, any of my ushers have papers? I want everyone to participate. You might have paper. You got paper, papers, Eric? Who, who still needs one? Raise your hand. Got some over here, some over here. Far right. Here we go. So what I'm going to do again is I'm going to read these questions one at a time. And when I ask you, stay seated. When I ask you to stand up, I would love for you to stand up. And again, you're not representing yourself. You're not confessing anything for yourself. What you are is you're representing somebody in this room. Somebody that was willing to be honest, somebody that was willing to be vulnerable, in order to help look at this, are we all actually alone? Here we are, July 28th, 2024, at Boulevard Christian Church, a lot of Christians in here. So here's the question. First question is this, if your paper has marked down, first question is, do you struggle with depression, fear, or anxiety? If your paper says yes, will you please stand up? Take a seat. Second question is this. Have you ever thought about suicide? Stand up if your answer is yes. Take a seat. Third question. Have you ever been addicted to something? If your person said yes, go ahead and stand up. Take a seat. Do you take any medication for any mental or psychological disorder? If you do, please stand. If your person said yes, please stand up. Take a seat. Are you lonely? If the person said yes, would you mind standing up? Are you lonely? Take a seat. 
Have you ever struggled to believe that God can love you and forgive you? If the answer is yes, go ahead and stand up. This is our church. This is our body of believers. Take a seat. Last question. Do you think that Christian community is vitally important to the life of a believer? If your person said yes, please stand up. Absolutely. You guys go ahead and take a seat. I hope what you witness, I hope what you see, you are not alone. And here's what I want you to do, church. I want you to listen. You think you're alone? You're not. You wonder if God wants you. He does. You think church is full of perfect people? It isn't. And you doubt that grace is for you. But guess what? It is. And you might wonder, where could I possibly fit in? Right here. I think you can fit in right here. Because here's the reality that we all need to know. Last slide, last point. We are all in the same boat. So what you can do is grab a paddle. We're all in the same boat. So what you can do is grab a paddle. My brother is a pastor at Hope City Church in Joplin, a great church, and this is one of their sayings. One of their sayings is they want people and want to acknowledge, hey, our lives look a little bit different. We're a little bit different ages. We have a little bit different interests. We have a different culture, different way of growing up, but we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat, and we can sit here and talk about the boat, or you can grab a paddle. And what that looks like at Boulevard Christian Church is not pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, not sinning less this week than you did last week, which would be desirable, but here's what we think it should be, that you are not going to fight this battle alone, but instead you're like, hey, I acknowledge I am broken and I need my community and I need Jesus to lift me up. That is what Pathways is about. And here's what I want you to do, and here's what I hope that you do, that you take that piece of paper home, and you have no idea, you have no idea whose paper that is, but you put it someplace that you'll see it every day for just a week. And here's what I hope that you'll know, you are not alone, and that you will pray for that person. Again, not knowing you have any idea who it is or what their day currently looks like, but that you're part of the body of Christ, and that somebody, you'll see it. Absolutely, absolutely. But here's what I hope you see. I hope you see that piece of paper that you do not fill out, but it represents a brother or sister in this room. And that what you say is, they are broken. And then you immediately know, and I am broken. But thank you, God, for Jesus Christ and his church. And maybe what you'll remember is that Boulevard is a place of imperfect people. But man, we got a perfect God. And that God gave you this community. And if he gave you this community, you also have a role to play. You have a role to play. No matter what you're going through, no matter how many boxes you checked off, we worship a God that brings life to death. And we're about to ready to celebrate a baptism in which we're going to signify going from, going from death to life. You can do that too. And as we celebrate, what I, would, what I would love for you to do is we stand and worship and we sing. And as, as the following weeks, we come back and talk about different areas of community, different areas of small group, different areas of what God wants us to live our lives. Here's what I hope you do. I hope you realize that living life alone is no way to live life. And instead, I'm going to live life in the community that God has placed for me. Man. God in his word calls, calls the body, um, or calls the church, he compares it to a body. And the ear can't say to the eye, I don't need you. We need each other. And that is why we're here. Man, hey, I want to pray for you guys. We're going to stand and worship and sing. Father God, thankful for this community. Thank you for this church. Thank you for your son and your spirit, God. As we just think about what you're asking us to do, it is impossible on our own. It is undoable on our own. It is unwise on our own, Father. We come to you. Not because we are perfect and we want to save other people to perfection, God, but we want to save other people for you. God, we know that we cannot do anything on our own, Lord, but you can. And I ask that you'd work through us. You'd work through us as a body, work through us as families, as individuals, to make sure that your kingdom come. God, thank you for Christ. Thank you for this body of Christ. Thank you for the church. God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.